Here's a recording of me and my sister saying the same vowel quality. Ah. Ah. Now, that presumably didn't sound all that strange, but when you think about it, there is something a little bit perplexing about it. So, me and my sister obviously have different voices. She has a higher pitched voice than me. Um, the timbre of our voices is different. But, despite the fact that we were producing different sounds because we have different voices, you could tell that the vowel quality we were producing was about the same. So how is it that we could be simultaneously producing different sounds because we have different voices and yet producing the same vowel quality? Why is it that we were both saying ah but we both sounded different? Do you see what I mean? What is it about vowel quality that makes it different to just a person's voice? That's what we're going to explore um, in this video and in order to do so we need to go a bit into acoustics. I'm going to try and use some analogies which may turn out not to be fantastic and if anyone thinks of any better ones I could have used by all means um, say so in the comments and I will uh, put them in the description and credit you. But otherwise hopefully this video is um, interesting and not too much of a, a boring divergence from what I normally do. So let's say that my hand is an air particle hovering in a room and at the window of that room there's a fly buzzing around and as the fly's wings flap it forces the air particles around it to sort of vibrate and they force the air particles around them to vibrate and a wave travels across the room and our air particle which is a few yards away let's say is hit by that wave and it starts to vibrate as well. There are two ways that you can measure this vibration. One of those is frequency and one of those is amplitude. The frequency is how frequently the particle is completing one oscillation. In other words, how frequently it's going there and back again. And frequency is normally measured in hertz, and one hertz is one oscillation per second. So I can't exactly count seconds in my head, but something like one, two, three, four, five is one hertz because this is oscillating at one, you know, oscillating once every second. If it was oscillating twice every second, in other words, if it was vibrating more quickly, then that would be two hertz. If it was oscillating three times a second, that would be three hertz. So this is lower frequency. This is higher frequency. The other way of measuring these things is amplitude. And rather than being how fast, how frequently it's oscillating, that is how much it's oscillating. So this is high amplitude and this is low amplitude. But the fly buzzing isn't the only thing that's happening in the room. Let's say that somewhere else in the room there's a wasp buzzing or someone pressing a piano key or something like that. This particle is still in the middle of the same room and so as well as being hit by the vibrations, the sort of waves from the fly, it's also being hit by waves from other things producing sound like the wasp. So let's say that it's, you know, on a relatively low amplitude oscillation because of the fly. If it gets hit by a different sound wave, say from the wasp, and I don't think flies and wasps actually sound this different, but we'll say they do for the purposes of explanation. If it's doing this because of the fly and it gets hit by a different sound wave that's being generated by the wasp, it may start to do this. So you can see what's happening, hopefully. It now has two frequencies and two amplitudes at once. First of all, it has this relatively high frequency, low amplitude oscillation. And it also has this low frequency, high amplitude oscillation. So this particle can now be described in terms of two frequencies and two amplitudes at once because there are two sources of sound acting on it. The human body has a built-in system for producing sound and that starts at the vocal folds in the larynx so we can use those to produce a tone mm, and we have the muscular control to modulate the frequency of that tone mm, and also the amplitude of the tone mm, and we, we, we just have the control to be able to do that. But another thing we have control of is the rest of the vocal tract, the, 
the area going from the throat into the mouth and the insides of the mouth, the tongue, the teeth. Well, we don't have control of the individual teeth, but um, we have control of the mandible and things like that, and also the lips. Now we're going to talk about resonance. So take a system, and system is a very vague term that nobody really seems to define anywhere, but this bone, this seal bone, is an example of a system. Uh, this seal bone attached to this mug is now an example of a system. This seal bone, this mug, and the air in between them are a system. Basically, a system is just, as you can define it as broadly or as narrowly as is relevant to whatever you're studying or whatever you're doing at the time. So, a given system has its own natural frequencies or eigenfrequencies, but I'm going to use the term natural frequencies because it's just more descriptive and transparent. So yeah, a given system has natural frequencies. And these are the frequencies at which the system will happily vibrate, oscillate by default if there are no forces dampening that vibration. So this bone has a natural frequency at which the particles in it would vibrate if left to their own devices. Um, this glass with the water in it is another system um, which has its own natural frequency at which the particles in it would oscillate if left to their own devices. So, that is something approaching the natural frequency of this system. In reality, what you're hearing there is actually a combination of the natural frequency of this, the natural frequency of my fingernails, the natural frequency of my fingers, and so on and so forth, everything that's vibrating, all of those natural frequencies at once. But the, the natural frequency of the glass and water system is the one that dominates. So that is more or less the natural frequency of that system. Now, when a system has its own natural frequency, and then something outside of the system provides a frequency that is the same as the system's natural frequency, that matches the system's natural frequency, you get this effect called resonance. Now this is where I'd encourage you to watch the video I've linked in the description because that bloke has a speaker and a wine glass and can explain that, you know, illustrate this better than I can. But let's say you have a particle within our glass system, uh, our wine glass, and if you flick the wine glass, this particle wants to vibrate at a particular frequency, which is the natural frequency of that system. Dung! Dung! Eventually, dampening effects like air resistance and things like that slow it down to a stop. But if given the opportunity to vibrate by being flicked or something like that, dung! it will vibrate at its natural frequency. It won't vibrate faster or slower. It will vibrate at its natural frequency. Now, let's say you took a speaker or a singer that could produce a very precise note and you put them next to the wine glass and made them produce the exact note that was at the resonance frequency of the glass. Uh, the particles are going to take this opportunity to vibrate at their natural frequency because there's already a vibration at their natural frequency influencing them. Uh, and then when the speaker stops, uh, it carries on going for a little bit and then slows to a stop as well. And this is called resonance. When something that has a natural frequency has input from a frequency that, that matches its natural frequency, they will tend to resonate with each other and both oscillate at the same frequency. It's not quite as important to know about resonance for the purposes of this video, but it is important to know that systems have natural frequencies. And because systems often have changes in density and things like that, um, a given system will usually have quite a few natural frequencies. And the human vocal tract, which goes from sort of the larynx, well, some would say the lungs, the larynx, through to the mouth, um, has several natural frequencies. And it's these natural frequencies which produce uh, different 
sounds that all kind of layer on top of each other as we speak. So here I have open a program called Prat, and this shows us a spectrogram of an audio recording. And a spectrogram is the way of displaying uh, the, the things I was talking about earlier. So this is the spectrogram along the bottom, this uh, weird kind of gray mass. You can see the kind of uh, vertical lines are the vocal folds vibrating. This is the first recording, ah. and this is the recording of my sister. Ah. And uh, you can actually see the differences visualized. So how a spectrogram works is that this horizontal axis represents time. So one second passing, two seconds passing, three seconds passing. The vertical axis represents frequency. So down here are lower frequencies, up here are higher frequencies in Hertz. So up here things are oscillating more quickly, down here things are oscillating more slowly. And the brightness or darkness of a given area of the screen represents the amplitude. If that part of the screen is darker, it's at a higher amplitude and it's louder. If that part of the screen is brighter, it's at a lower amplitude and it's quieter. So what we have here is a representation of the various resonance frequencies coming out of my vocal tract and then my sister's vocal tract. And as you can see, they kind of divide up so that you can see the different resonance frequencies. Here's one, here's another, here's another, and maybe there's a very faint one up here. These are what we call acoustic formants. They're not always the easiest things to see. So Prat has this tool, if you click Formant, Show Formants. And it doesn't always do this perfectly, but the idea is that it will map the formants for you. So it will take uh, a line down the middle of where the formant is. Um, or if not a line, then it's kind of like a series of points. And you can actually um, ask it to tell you the formant uh, or the average formant within a given span of time. So I've highlighted this span of time here within my own pronunciation. Um, and if I say get first formant, then it will give me the frequency at which the first formant is. So that's 817 hertz. I can tell it to give me the second formant as well, and I can tell it to give me all the other formants. So to reiterate with a more zoomed in diagram of the spectrogram, uh, this is the, the one of me saying the vowel a formant is a peak in amplitude at a particular frequency. So the way that shows up in the graph is one of these dark patches. And again, as I say, these lines going up and down, up and down, up and down, the kind of ripply lines are the vocal folds vibrating. But uh, the kind of streaks where it gets darker, 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 um, these are the peaks of amplitude at particular frequencies. And these are what we call the formants. Um, when I tell uh, the software to get the first formant for me or to get the second formant for me in a given span of time, what it does is within that span of time that I've selected with my mouse, it um, takes all of these dots that it's plotted, first the ones for the first formant and then the ones for the second formant. It pulls out the frequencies that these dots are at and then it averages all of those frequencies in that formant within that stretch of time that I've selected. So when it says that the first formant is eight, 817 hertz in the area that I've selected, what it means is that these dots within the area that I selected are at frequencies, the mean average of which is 817 hertz, so 817 oscillations per second. The lowest formant uh, is called F1, formant 1, and that's the formant which is at the lowest frequency. The second formant up is F2, the third formant up is F3, and so on and so forth. Um, in order to determine the quality of a vowel, that is whether something is A or E or U, you only need usually the lowest two formants, this one and this one. The other formants determine things like the timbre of someone's voice, what they sound like relative to another person. And this 
is the answer to our question at the start of the video, how do people have different voices but can produce the same vowel qualities? If you look at it, you'll see that the first two formants, the lowest two formants, when I say a, ah, are not identical but very similar to the first two formants when my sister says a. Ah. We can probably actually work this out. Um, I'll put something on the screen, so that's 792. So as you can see, these are not identical, but between me and my sister, the first two formants, the lowest two formants, end up mapping very similarly. They look very similar. Whereas the higher formants, the third, fourth, fifth formants, whatever, look very different when I produce the sound to when my sister produces the sound. And that, um, that speaks to the fact that we have different voices. Her voice is higher pitched than mine. Um, and hopefully that has um, helped to clarify why two people can have different voices but produce the same vowel quality. Finally, I'm going to play you myself saying three different vowel qualities um, and I want you to watch the lowest two formants. So in the case of the first one is these two formants, in the case of the second one is these two formants, and in the case of the third one it's these two formants crunched together very, very low on the screen. Um, actually with the third one that's a good example of a, um, a back rounded vowel where prat um, the formants are so close together that prat can't always tell the difference between them. Uh, whereas the first one, e, is an example of one where the formants are very, the, the lowest formants are very, very far apart. So you can see the, the lowest formant and the second one up are miles apart. So let's play these now and you can hear um, the, the difference in vowel quality and see it in the spectrogram. E, a, u. E, a, u. Thank you very much indeed for watching and I will talk to you next time.